Hi, I'm Brady Forrest with the Rally Media here at Web2O Summit, and with me right now is Nick Bilton, lead technology writer at the New York Times, author of I Live in the Future and Here's How It Works, and he's currently working on a new book on privacy. Hey, Nick. How you doing, Brady? Good. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah. So we were on a panel yesterday talking about privacy and identity, Yep. and then we decided to have this kind of chat. Uh, yeah, um, it, was a, it was a great panel. Uh, uh, talked about the future of data and, and, and the things that will come up with that. So um, so I think one of the things that's happening right now is uh, uh, privacy, identity, data. Um, we're about to hit this new era of the web where it's going to become this, the central point uh, of conversation. Um, and, and there's a lot of different driving forces behind that. One is that data has become you know, the, the way that we track people online, the analytics and so on. But the other thing is that there's a lot of legislation going through Congress right now that's trying to protect, protect consumers' uh, information, and, uh, and none of it's actually made its way through yet. So, Yeah, hearing about legislation always scares me, because I yep. feel like the, the technology industry needs to regulate itself. It needs to protect the user mm -hmm. and just make sure the user understands what's going on. Correct. And so I always fear when politicians get involved because they play for new sound bites often. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a great point, but at the same time, uh, the technology in industry hasn't regulated itself, right? And so you've got a number of things that have happened where you have, for example, Facebook, where they have uh, a tremendous amount of data on us, pe literally petabytes of data that are collected every, you know, every week or so um, that is being used to deliver advertising and things that we don't even know what they're doing with it yet. Um, you have problems where uh, companies like Sony, for example, that was hacked earlier this year, um, 77 million people's personal information was actually uh, taken from the company, um, and then include personal information like the social security numbers and home addresses and credit card, and so on. And um, and there wasn't any legislation to hold that company accountable after after that information was stolen. Um, and one of the things that came out afterwards was that Sony had reduced its um, uh, its security team. They were using five-year-old servers, outdated software, all of these things that. Um, that they were supposed to be policing themselves and they had this responsibility to do that and, and they didn't. Um, and so it seems like at this point, uh, we're actually getting to a point where we, we, we do need someone to step in and say, this is what you need to do uh, to a certain degree that shouldn't go as far as, um, as determining everything. Yeah, I just worry, you know, when I hear about things like, uh, should Congress be regulating Google's index and the features and that type of kind of misunderstanding of yeah. technology, I agree that there should be penalties when a company violates uh, the contract with the user in terms of giving up their data to a third party. Yeah. Um, but I have no major issue with my data being stored by Facebook. I mean, I use that service. I know what happens. However, I do think that Facebook has to do a much better job and any of these other services with making more people understand what they're storing and how they're, and what type of, how to, yeah control the sharing of it. Well, one of the problems with Facebook, for example, and I don't want to just pick on them because I think everyone has, has got these problems, is that, that the users don't have any idea. You know, I spoke to Eric Schmidt earlier this year um, when he was CEO of Google and, and said, you know, by default, Google um, stores people's uh, search history. Uh, most people don't know that, that the company is doing that. Um, and you know, I said, well, why don't you actually put a banner across the top that says, as someone comes to the site for the first time, that they're told that that, that information is there and they can turn that, that setting off. And he said, well, it would be too confusing. People don't understand that stuff. But, but people have no concept of the things that are being tracked by them. Um, you know, uh, when you look at Facebook, um, they literally probably know more about, about things that I am doing than, than anyone else I know, any of my closest friends, because they see me clicking on pictures of girls and they see me clicking on articles outside of the site, listening to Britney Spears, whatever that is. Um, and I don't know what it is that they're doing and what they're doing with that information. And sure, most of it is to, is to contribute advertising. But at the same time, uh, they add these new features, they turn on these new features, and they, they, they turn them on for everyone without any concept of the, the consequences for, for people involved. And the education. Yeah, yeah, I had default post settings set up, yeah. and then after F8, those got wiped away. Correct. With no knowledge. So, yeah, I, yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. And I mean, you know, as we discussed yesterday, they do a really good job of advertising new features when they want to. Yes, exactly. You know, when that, you know, look, I understand it from, from Facebook's perspective, right? So one of the things that Facebook is doing um, is they're putting out new features and they're putting out new products and uh, they have 800 million active users. And if they, turn, if they don't turn them on by default, then probably 100 million people will actually use it. And it doesn't actually, it takes away from the experience. But there has to be a balance in between. You can't just turn people on to a, a new product without them even knowing what it is or how to turn it off. Um, at, at the 
the though, same time. Though, you know, in some ways, Facebook actually asking users yeah. if they want to upgrade their website yeah. is new. Like yes. that's, that's kind of a new thing. Yeah. Like Gmail beta was just rolling through. Yeah. Flickr, when it updates its features, just rolls right through. However, I think Facebook has touched such a nerve with some of its major changes like Beacon and the newsfeed when it first launched, that even if they're accepted now. Well, I think part of the reason for that is that, you know, when you look at the updates that Flickr does, when Flickr updates its site and changes something, um, it only takes place on Flickr. The way that Facebook works is it is not just Facebook, it is a thing that is, it, it is everywhere all over the web. You know, billions of people hit the like button on articles every single day. Um, and so you're not just, when they're updating their services and they're updating a new feature, they're not just updating people that are coming to Facebook.com, they're updating across, across the universe that, that is the internet. Um, and so there's, there's completely different ramifications involved behind that. Um, and I think that's one of the problems. The, the other thing that I think is, is a huge problem is, is um, privacy policies. Uh, you know, uh, privacy policies are, are, are thousands and thousands of words long. No one can read them. I just uh, signed up for, uh, got my new I iPhone, iOS 4, um, and... Um, yeah, it was like 67 pages or so, something. Yeah, exactly, 67 page privacy policy. Am I really gonna read that and even have any concept of what that means? Um, and, and so, you know, I think that there, are, there needs to be changes across the entire web with, with how people um, are told about what, what's happening with their data um, and having access to that. But another aspect, too, is um, I wrote a story uh, last year, a front page story for the Sunday Style section about uh, reputation.com, which is a reputation mm -hmm. manager. Yeah. Um, and the lead of the story was the internet never forgets, and it really does not forget. It is literally, once something is out there, it is impossible to have it removed. That's why I try to make sure that nothing about me is ever online. Correct, but 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 okay. So now let's just say that you're. Uh, that's not true though, because uh, <laughs> I've seen pictures of you in dresses at Burning Man. Um, kilts, kilts, kilts. Sorry, um, uh, but okay. So you don't mind that because you're a social person. But what if what if someone who has a different profile or whatever it is um, doesn't want those pictures online? And even if they're not putting them there, um, they could be in in a public place, and an image of them shows up, and there's nothing they can do to remove that. Um, no, absolutely. Um, my friends who are not in the tech field constantly are, are much more protective than those of us in it, just because it's not, it's a different world for them. Yeah, and, and I think, the, I think tech, the tech world uh, is much more forgiving of yes. kind of social oddities That's because they want to be, the they want to be in the limelight. The, yeah. You know, they want to be seen by everyone and, and count but, how many followers they have and so Yeah, on. but that's part of the tech bubble, yeah. I think, that yeah. happens and the people who actually design the products live in those bubbles. Correct. I think that, uh, I think that th th there's another part to that is, um, you know, I've had instances where I've learned the hard way online. Uh, one example was I, I took a photo of my sister um, uh, who was nine months pregnant at the beach and I posted it online uh, on Flickr, uh, not thinking anything of it. Uh, woke up in the morning and it, you know, had 70,000 uh, views on it. And I was, I was like, what the hell's going on? I traced it back, it had been put on some some pornographic website for uh, um, for pregnant women in bikinis and awesome um, awesome uh, and uh, uh, my sister actually thought it was amazing uh, because uh, she got some attention from it. Wait, but it could have gone the other way. It could you have were gone lucky. the other way. But it, for me, it was a, it was a, a really defining moment because I was like, wow, this is uh, this is an experience that uh, that I didn't really anticipate. Just a simple photo like that. This happens a lot with kids. That pe parents that take pictures of their kids in the bathtub. Uh, and put them on yep. Facebook, and people start liking them that they don't even know who they are, um, and they end up on, on, on sites that we don't want uh, uh, people going to. Um, the other aspect to me that recently happened is I just came out of a, a very long relationship, um, uh, nine years long, and, um, and when, when we finally ended it, um, I had to go through Facebook and, and kind of decide if I was going to keep the photos of me and my ex online. And, and my philosophy of it was, when I start dating uh, uh, women again, um, I wouldn't invite them over for dinner and leave photos of my ex and I in Costa Rica, you know, pasted yeah. on the wall. So why would I do that in a digital setting? Mm -hmm. um, and these are things I just, we haven't really come to the realization or understanding of what these implications are going to be. Where do you think the mobile phone comes in? Because I, you know, it works for me that this, that this is just linked to me and that I'm the only one who uses it. But, you know, the tablet around my house, it drives me crazy that there's not different profiles and I can't just leave my iPad out for the house to use as a remote yeah. because they would have access to my Gmail. It's worse with an Android tablet because they, they're tied into all of my Google services. Yeah. I think you know, <clears throat> one of the things that's going to happen is, um, is there's no denying that the mobile phone is going to be the device that we, we interact with everything, right? And mm -hmm. it's no denying it's going to become smarter um, and it's already getting to that point. Um, the next generation of mobile devices are going to have 
20 times more sensors than, than exist today, where, whereas they have perspiration sensors so they can see how you're feeling. They have take advantage of the camera to make sure that it's you that's using it for security reasons, all these different things. But on the flip side of that, there's the ramifications of the fact that um, your privacy is also being affected by this. And if, if someone gains access to that information in a way that, they, that, that we didn't anticipate by for example, hacking the phone and tracking your location and looking at banking information and things like that, um, it's going to be a whole different story. And I think that uh, th there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of fear around the kinds of information that one could get out of your mobile device. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we know um, your contact information, your, your billing, your credit card, your location, the things that, are, that, that could actually be used in, in very negative ways. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see if companies do self-regulate because it's a whole different ball game than, than, than the web um, or if it's going to take some sort of legislation that's going to come in to try to, try to fix that. Yeah, again, I just fear, I, I feel like no, I there agree. should be penalties for breach of contract, but I fear anything that has Congress or other legislature okay, but dictating features. So, so, so here's a perfect example, right? If you go and you look at the privacy policy on, on 500 startups, across the web, I guarantee that they will all originate from 10 privacy policies. And you see, I see it all the time. Startups that, that they don't, there's four or five people, they're programmers, and they're like, oh shit, we need a privacy policy, right? So off they do, and they go to, to some website that they like, they copy and paste it, change the word Flickr to, you know, bobsdonuts.com, and, um, and, and it doesn't even make sense for the service that they're using. Um, and so just something as simple as that, there needs to be some sort of standard or some sort of understanding from, a, from, from both a consumer side and, a, um, and a, a developer side. Yeah, I would love some sort of like Creative Commons iconography. Yes, You could very absolutely. quickly read it, double maybe in the details, but at least be a base <coughs> understanding of what the service is providing. Yeah, I completely agree. So have you ever seen, there's an EFF feature where they actually track changes yes. to privacy policy yep. or terms of service, mm -hmm. and so you can sign up to track different companies, yep. and I, I get alerts for those, and it's scary how often they change. Well, it's scary. I mean, the perfect example with Sony was, uh, so when Sony was, the Sony was breached, um, there was no, uh, there was Senator, Senator Blumenthal from Connecticut, all these different senators that came in and said, you really need to tell consumers what happened. Uh, so one of the laws that exists, um, and it's not a federal law, it's a state level law, says that you have to notify consumers after seven days of, of an attack. Mm -hmm. So of course they wait literally seven days to, to the last hour to notify people. Um, and, um, and, and they knew about it the day it happened, right? Yep. Uh, when, they, when they found out, they, they should, have, should have told people. But what happened was, because there's no uh, federal legislation, they, um, they were sued by uh, individuals, right? So, um, and what is now becoming a class action suit. So now Sony went back through and they said, you know what, we're going to change our privacy policy. And if you use a PlayStation device, um, you have to adhere to this new rule that says you will if anything ever happens with our um, with your data, you cannot be part of a class action suit. To but sue can us. will that actually hold up in a court of law? Um, I and mean, that seems it, it depends what happens in the future. Right, mm -hmm. right now uh, it, it may not uh, because um, they've changed the policy in the middle. Of, uh, but for a new user, it could hold up because it, the, the lawyers could say, "Well, you signed this." Wow, well, that's kind of agree to it. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on to location sharing. Yep. I mean, people when they use credit cards, have their location shared out to, a third, to the credit card company. When they use a mobile phone, it's shared out to the carrier. And now people with third-party APIs on Android, iPhone, when it's mobile, they can share their location out to anybody, uh, to Facebook, to Flickr. And people are running into all sorts of problems with this. And they always ask me, like, why would you want to share your location? I always list it out as a cost-benefit analysis. Like, I get value from having a credit card, I get value from having a mobile phone, that comes with using either of these. I, I'm pro location sharing in general. <clears throat> so I'm pro location sharing too, but I also there are there. It's I think it's back to this balance of, of, of when it makes sense and when it doesn't. Um, and and I wonder if to what degree people will be willing, willing to share that information. It's apparent that our privacy has become a, an economy online, right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we give I give Google access to my email to deliver ads because I don't pay for Gmail. Um, the same with search. If, if Gmail said, pay me $100 a year and you won't get any ads, I probably wouldn't do it, right? Uh, so I'm paying for the service with my privacy. Um, but when you start to take that to location and, and different types of things, um, it's going to be interesting to see how consumers react. From a business standpoint, I think you know, it makes complete sense. There's a, a tens of billions of dollars in advertising that has completely dried up as local newspapers have gone away. Um, and can be replaced by, uh, by these devices. So when Apple introduced the uh, iAds platform, it wasn't that they wanted to get into advertising. Uh, they knew that they could start to deliver micro-level advertising to consumers based on their location. 
mm -hmm. right? It was all about location. Yeah. Uh, with Facebook, um, the same thing. When when they're uh, applying places to their to their platform, it's not about like, hey, we want people to check in. It's about how can we deliver ads that are location based uh, at that point. Um, and I think that that what what we're going to see is whether um, it becomes too invasive for consumers. Um, and for me, I mean, I embrace every social media outlet there is, but I'm very wary of, of how much I share about my location. Um, I check in maybe once a day, once every couple of days, um, and there's a lot of places that I don't want people to know that I've been, whether it's because it's a, a private place or because it's just it's just something that I'm doing with, with one or two other people. Yeah, I'm much more often to, or much more likely to check in if I'm somewhere like at the Web 2.0 Summit. Right. But, you know, in wrapping, let's talk about kind of the battle of pseudonyms versus real names. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I love the fact that on Twitter I have three or four different handles right now. Yeah. But they're mostly, it's myself and then a couple of different organizations that I, that I run. Yeah, so Facebook has, has been adamant about the fact that they will never let pseudonyms on the site and that every part of the web should have an identity tied to it. And their argument is that if we had that, we wouldn't have the trolls that we have today. Um, sure, that's correct, but I don't want people, let's just say that I had some sort of disease I didn't want people to know about. I don't want people to know that I've been a part of a conversation about that. Um, there's been this, you know, this big movement lately um, to help kids come out online um, that are uh, gay or lesbian. Mm -hmm. And they are, um, they're, they're in chat rooms and they're having these discussions with people that are helping them but they shouldn't, shouldn't be tied back to their Facebook page to, 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 to be able to part, uh, be a part of that conversation. Um, and so, you know, one of the, uh, uh, Chris Poole uh, Moot, who, who runs 4chan. And um, Canvas. And, and can now Canvas. We got into this discussion last year, and one of the things that we said was that the, um, you know, anonymity online, especially for kids, is, is the most important thing, I think, of the web. Because when you're a kid, you, you make mistakes, you get in trouble, you say things you shouldn't, and you learn from those mistakes. And having that tied back to your identity indefinitely, especially in an age where the internet does not forget anything, um, I think is probably one of the worst things that we can have. Yeah, I mean, and I think the reason Google is running into this problem is that they have no outlet mm -hmm. for organizations or for, at least on Facebook, you have the ability to create a page for your business yeah. and some other third party. Yeah. And Google doesn't have that yet. So that it's kind of like early days of Friendster where they were deleting accounts. Yep. At least on Facebook, you can like something. Yeah. But yeah, I, there are many things I would just never, ever take to Facebook Correct. for exactly the reasons you're talking about. Well, and it's funny, I had the, I, you know, they just introduced Spotify, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. that you can see what you're listening to. And I had a bunch of friends over, and we logged into my Spotify on the computer, and we were messing around listening to Britney Spears and Bruno Mars and stuff. Didn't think anything of it. Next day, I checked my Facebook, and there's all these likes against these songs that I'd been listening to. And I was like, oh, great. Now people think that I listen to Britney Spears all the time, which is fine. Um, we know you, you do. <clears throat> yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. She's my favorite, my favorite singer. Uh, but at the same time, so now they're going to start introducing uh, articles people have read. And I've seen this in the beta mm -hmm. feeds that are coming through. I don't want them to, people to know which article I'm reading unless I choose to share that article. Um, and, and that is, I think, a, 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 it's going to be a very difficult thing and could backfire uh, uh, in a rapid way with them. Yeah, not just the privacy, but also just the glut of information for other people. Yeah. Like, I don't actually mind Facebook knowing that if they want to surface that in aggregate <coughs> and start to recommend articles to mm -hmm. people, but I'm with you. I wouldn't want them just exposing that information. Yeah.